everyone. In this video, I'm going to introduce price discrimination as a pricing strategy. And really at the heart of it, price discrimination describes a range of pricing behaviors that involves the firm setting different prices for the same or almost the same product. So what does all this mean? Well, it's actually really all about our demand curve. So if we look at a standard demand curve, it's typically negatively sloped like this. And what's important to understand when we're thinking about price discrimination is that our demand curve actually tells us about the willingness to pay, that's WTP, for each marginal unit consumed. So at point A, for instance, the quantity is 40 and the price is 60. And usually we say that this means, well, if the price is equal to 60, 40 units will be demanded. And that's fine. But we can also interpret that as the maximum willingness to pay for the 40th unit is equal to 60. So we're interpreting the height of demand as indicating the willingness to pay for each marginal unit. And this means that if we're talking about, say, a market demand curve where our demand includes many consumers, the fact that our demand curve has a negative slope essentially means that there are some consumers up here in this section of the demand curve, they have a relatively high willingness to pay for the good, the willingness to pay decreases as we travel along the curve, so this group in this section of demand, they have a lower willingness to pay. And right down here, these guys here, relative to the others, they have a very low willingness to pay. Now, we also get this sort of a shape in our demand when we're just talking about individual demand, in which case the individual here has a high willingness to pay for the first or initial units consumed and the willingness to pay for each successive unit diminishes because of diminishing marginal benefit. And so you end up with a downward sloping demand curve for these reasons. Price discrimination then tries to, if we're talking about a whole market, set different prices such that those with a higher willingness to pay are actually being charged a higher price than those with a lower willingness to pay who are charged a lower price. So we discriminate between different types of customers within a market. And we can also see this same sort of strategy at the level of individual demand. If we can get customers to essentially pay higher amounts for those units that they have a higher willingness to pay for and lower amounts for those units which they have a low willingness to pay for. That's also price discrimination. Now it's worth mentioning at this point that because the slope, that negative slope of our demand curve is so critical for price discrimination because that variation in willingness to pay that it represents means that we can have different prices. Well, this means that price discrimination is really only for price makers who face a downward sloping demand curve. So most often we talk about price discrimination when we're thinking about monopolists. Price discrimination is not then for perfectly competitive firms who are price takers who actually face a perfectly elastic horizontal demand curve at the market price. And this sort of targeting of different segments of the market with different prices, if successful, is going to be better for the firm in comparison to charging only one price. So we're contrasting price discrimination to the standard single priced firm maximization situation, which we learn about in our classes. In this situation, the firm takes their downward sloping demand curve. They don't set multiple prices. They just set the quantity that they produce Q star such that marginal revenue MR is equal to marginal cost MC and they just charge one price P star for all of those Q star units. Now this is actually a good place to introduce a second interpretation of price discrimination. So price discrimination as an attempt by the firm to capture as much surplus in the market as possible. So for our firm who is only charging one price here, our consumer surplus would be this red area here. This area sums up the difference between our willingness to pay and the price for all of the units consumed. Producer surplus will be the green area here. This is price minus marginal cost for all of the units produced. And this area here, the purple area is deadweight loss. This is the possible surplus that has not been realized in this market, essentially because the price has been set above marginal cost. So I do have another video just on deadweight loss and surplus. I'll link to it in the description below, just in case you need additional explanation around this. So that's the distribution of surplus when we have a single priced firm. If the firm can price discriminate, however, well, let's look up at this part of the demand curve. They can charge these guys here with a higher willingness to pay a higher price. 
So let's put in a price like P prime perhaps. So everyone who has a willingness to pay higher than P prime pays P prime. And this actually means that the first Q prime units are sold at that price P prime. The rest of the units from Q prime to Q star, those units are sold at P star. Hopefully you can see that as a result of introducing that additional price, our producer surplus has increased. So the green area increases and consumer surplus has been reduced. So that's what happens when we introduce kind of these higher prices to the market. Some of that consumer surplus is taken and turned into producer surplus because we're able to charge some people those higher prices. Now down in this area, that's dead weight loss. If we price discriminate, the firm can charge these guys a lower price and get some more surplus that way. So perhaps we introduce another price like P prime prime. So all of the consumers in this part of the demand curve now will pay P prime prime. And we get to sell some additional units here, the units from Q star to Q prime prime, and they're being sold at P prime prime. Hopefully you can see that as a result of this introduction of this third lower price, we are actually getting, well, some more consumer surplus because some consumers are now engaged in the market and trading when they weren't before. So we take away some dead weight loss, but we also get more producer surplus. In introducing more prices then, the firm is capturing more and more surplus. And it's a really useful way of thinking about price discrimination. Now I know what you're thinking, how exactly does a firm price discriminate? Well, typically economics textbooks divide price discrimination into three different types. We have first degree or perfect price discrimination, second degree or menu pricing, and third degree price discrimination. So I will just now briefly, very briefly review these three types. I will warn you that there is just so much content to do around this stuff. And so I am going to leave a more thorough analysis of the three different types to individual videos on each type. So I'll link to those videos in the description uh, when they're done. So really just very briefly then, first degree or perfect price discrimination is when the firm manages to perfectly discriminate over every unit in the market that they sell. And as a result of this perfect discrimination, they grab all of the possible surplus in the market. So one consequence of this is that the firm actually produces at the efficient level of production where all possible trades are realized. So they produce where marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. They're exhausting all of the possible trades that can occur. And as a result, there is no dead weight loss in the market when the firm does this. So the outcome is good from an allocation efficiency kind of point of view, uh, but the problem is that the producer does get all of that surplus. Now there are a number of strategies that the firm can use in order to do this or to approach this ideal. Probably the most common way that is mentioned in textbooks is just to charge the willingness to pay for each unit. So we charge price equal to willingness to pay for each unit sold. Now, second degree price discrimination is when the firm constructs a menu of options which their consumers can choose from. These options will differ from one another in various respects, and they will be designed such that those consumers with a higher willingness to pay self-select into the more expensive option, and those with a lower willingness to pay, you know, get the, get the cheaper option. So as an example, the firm might offer quantity discounts where if a consumer buys more, the price per unit is reduced. Another possibility might be offering a premium versus a basic bundle where the premium version includes some perks and the basic bundle is made unattractive in various ways. And just as a really quick example of this, let's think about the difference between cheaper flights to a particular place versus more expensive flights. So our cheaper flights might include more inconvenient layover times, they might be really, really late at night or very, very early in the morning. And this might induce higher willingness to pay consumers to opt for more expensive flights with more convenient times, uh, less layover and that sort of thing. Really the key to second degree price discrimination is the idea that our consumer self selects into these different groups. And so the challenge for the firm when they are engaging in second degree price discrimination is really how to design their menu options so they successfully discriminate between the groups in their market. 
And this second degree price discrimination kind of strategy is very different from third degree price discrimination, where our firm knows that there are different types of consumers in the market, and they have a really easy way of distinguishing between those groups. For instance, a cinema might offer cheaper prices to students or pensioners that have a low willingness to pay because they're not in paid employment if they are able to identify students or pensioners through, say, identification cards. Once we have those identification cards, we can really easily discriminate between groups. All the firm really needs is that proof from the customer uh, that they belong to, to one group or another. And so that's it. That's a really quick review of the three different types. As I said before, when I do the more specific thorough videos on each type, uh, I'll put links to in the video. In any case, I hope the video helped. Hope you guys are keeping happy and safe.